Welcome one and all to Real Deal. This is the show, the entertainment news show, where I just sit in a chair and talk about what's new in the world of entertainment news this week, and hopefully people enjoy it, because I've been doing it for 14 weeks. My name is Andrew Fantasia, thank you so much for tuning in, and as usual, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and give some love to that subscribe button as well. What's new? Well... Here's a new thing. We all knew Spider-Man Homecoming was getting a sequel. That's what they call a no-brainer, kids. But guess what? It sounds like we have official confirmation on the name of the sequel. So we don't have to sit around calling it Untitled Spider-Man Homecoming sequel anymore. Because that was very hard to say. No, Tom Holland accidentally let the ball drop on this one and he revealed the title. And we were all a little bit sketched out at first. We we're like, is this for real? Is this legit? And it turns out, yes, it is. Kevin Feige has now stepped forward and confirmed that this is the title. And it will be called Spider-Man Far From Home. I dig it. It sounds like it's carrying on from the title Homecoming. Yeah. Homecoming, Far From Home. It works. Uh, it works on different levels because we know he's going to be traveling. He's not going to just be in New York in this movie. So that's pretty dope. I, I like that it's not a conventional superhero sounding title you know like i like that it's not just called spider-man revenge of the scorpion spider-man mysterio strikes you know it, it's a cool little not conventional title i like conventional titles too i think they like especially in star wars i you know i love the fact that there's a movie called revenge of the sith I, it, that just sounds really fun um but you don't always have to sound like that and far from home does not sound like a typical sequel subtitle but it works it really works. So I adore this title. I think Marvel titles across the board have been a lot of fun. I like what they do with them. I like how some series are, you know, just numbers like Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Iron Man 3. Other ones like Captain America and Spider-Man, they have these subtitles going on. Guardians of the Galaxy goes Volume 2, Volume 3, which I love to death. And now Ant-Man just adds And the Wasp. I mean, all these little different ways to title your movies is really creative and clever, and I love it to death. I've promised on this channel multiple times I'm going to make a video about how I feel about the way certain movies are titled and the way sequels are titled, etc., etc., because I have a lot to say on that, surprisingly, and I will do that. This just adds more fuel to that fire. So Far From Home is a glorious title. I like it. Speaking of the Marvel Cinematique, universe, a lot of critics have had the chance to see early screenings of Ant-Man and the Wasp, and according to their Twitter reactions, this movie is gonna be really good. At least that's the general consensus. I, I haven't seen a negative comment yet, I haven't even seen a lukewarm comment yet. Everybody seems to be really on board with Ant-Man and the Wasp. They keep stating how it is very different from Infinity War. It's a nice change of pace. It's a breath of fresh air. It's lighter in tone, obviously. It's lighter, period. It's a shorter movie. But it gives you what it promises. It gives you a fun Ant-Man and the Wasp adventure. That's what everybody's saying across the board. It is a ton of fun. A lot of people are also saying there's a lot of really cool surprises that you're going to have a lot of fun with. There's There are moments that are even funnier than the first one, so you're going to laugh a lot. Many, many of these critics seem to agree that... The two post-credits scenes in Ant-Man and the Wasp are worth the price of admission alone. And that gets me really excited. Uh, personally, I think somebody from the world of Ant-Man is going to disappear because snap, crackle, pop happens. So, you know what I'm saying? But I'm really glad to hear that these reviews are stellar. Um, and if the movie lives up to the reviews, then Marvel is batting three for three this year because Black Panther rocked and Infinity War rocked. That would be a big win, not only for the studio, but for big franchises like this in general in the future. You know, 20 years from now, if there's a franchise called McGillicuddy and the Elephants, they can't all be winners, kids. If McGillicuddy and the Elephants is a big franchise and it's got a lot of moving pieces and the executive producer of McGillicuddy and the Elephants sits in the room with the board of directors and whatnot and says, you know what? We have a lot of story ideas to move this saga forward. I say we do three movies a year. And the executives, being executives, would look at each other all skeptically and be like, three McGillicuddy and the Elephants movies a year? That, 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 that doesn't sound possible. <laughs> Stocks. <laughs> Shareholders. <laughs> and... This executive producer would be like, no, 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 no. Don't forget everybody. Marvel 2018. They had three movies. And all these business people would be like, 
he has a very good point. We're, we're going to stop objecting now. <laughs> we make this noise even when we're not objecting. <laughs> so this is a beautiful, shining, glorious, golden beacon of an example. And hopefully it sets a precedent. Because I love this kind of storytelling. <laughs> In case you couldn't tell, I feel like I should just change the name of Real Deal so it's called The Marvel Show. Because I talk about Marvel every week on the show. But that's just because the cinematic universe they built is so damn good and rich that there's literally news coming out about it every week. There you go. Ant-Man and the Wasp comes out in July. I am looking forward to it very much. Paul Rudd is my man crush, so I'm gonna make sure my hair looks good because the actors can see through the screens and they know exactly what the audience looks like. But Marvel movies are always on everybody's radar. One movie that's not on a whole lot of people's radar that I am chomping at the bit to see is a little film called Bad Times at the El Royale. And no, this is not a sequel to Fast Times at Ridgemont High, despite what some of you might think. This movie was written and directed by Drew Goddard, who also directed The Martian. And The Martian was my second favorite movie of 2015. I could not get enough of The Martian. And this is more of that trademark Drew Goddard style. I mean, this guy was a writer not only in The Martian, but he, he wrote for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He wrote for Angel. He just has a lot of great television scripts under his belt. This guy gets shit done. And this movie, Bad Times at the El Royale, just looks like a whole lot of fun. And this week we got new character posters for the whole shebang. It's got a pretty big cast. So you can see here we've got all these great posters. Uh, and they are the same image. Just with different characters about to enter the El Royale Hotel. And the whole story with this hotel is that it sits right there on the state line. Between California and Nevada. And if the trailers are any indication. A whole lot of crazy stuff is going to go down at the El Royale. Dare I say bad times? will happen there. At least bad for the people staying there. For us, it's going to be a whole lot of fun. I recently saw the movie Hotel Artemis, and that was not bad, but just bland across the board. This looks like it's going to be the spicy jalapeno pepper version of the regular bland sandwich, bland witch, that was Hotel Artemis. Bad times at the El Royale. Cannot get here fast enough. I'm very excited to watch it, and these posters really amp up that excitement for me. So if this movie has not been on your radar, I implore ye to put it on said radar when it hits theaters this October. There's a new rumor flying around in Star Wars land. I'm not talking about the Star Wars land that's physically being built here on Earth in the theme parks. I just mean Star Wars land as like a like a metaphor, like La La Land. According to this rumor, which is still 100% a rumor, and you should take this with a nice little pinch of salt, maybe throw some Mrs. Dash on there for good measure. But people have reported seeing Ewan McGregor, Obi-Wan Kenobi himself, visiting with J.J. Abrams to schedule meetings for him to secretly shoot a small scene for Star Wars Episode Nine. Now, production hasn't even begun yet. They haven't rolled cameras on Episode Nine yet. That's supposed to happen, I think, in July or August. He clearly has not walked onto set and filmed anything yet. They're probably just hashing it out together, he and JJ, if this is a legit story. Obviously, everybody wants to see Obi-Wan again. A lot of people want to see him with his own movie, myself included. A lot of people are like, you know what? We don't need to see him in his own movie, but we'd love to see him again. That's perfectly reasonable, too. Ewan McGregor is universally loved as Obi-Wan, even if those same people didn't fancy one through three all that much. Of course, this is a positive of course this is something that's going to get people excited. Of course, if this story is fake, we understand why somebody would fake it for all that positive attention. Back in episode 8, we got Yoda. We got a nice little Yoda Force Ghost, and that was not spoiled. There were whispers that Frank Oz did some stuff, but Yoda was still a nice surprise. If Obi-Wan shows up in episode 9, I hope it's the same kind of deal. I hope there's whispers like this, like this story we're covering right now. This story is a whisper. And I hope nothing gets revealed until December 20th, 2019, my god is that ever far away, at which point we will see Ghost Obi-Wan, perhaps? Or maybe Flashback Obi-Wan, which would be even more interesting. Here's the thing, Mark Hamill is down to come back. He is 100% down to come back if they want him. And Force Ghost Luke would make sense because Rey is, I'm assuming, the one who's going to see him. And Rey knew Luke. She didn't know who Obi-Wan was. She had no clue who Obi-Wan was. That's why Qui-Gon Jinn didn't show up at the end of Return of the Jedi, because Luke would have been like, Hey Yoda, hey Dad, hey Obi-Wan. 
Who's that dude? He looks like the guy from Taken. Should I be scared right now? So Ray seeing Ewan McGregor doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think of the fact that seeing Mark Hamill is a lot more plausible and very, very possible. Having said that, J.J. Abrams has gone on a record to say that episode 9, he wants it to wrap up not just this trilogy, but all three Star Wars trilogies. He wants it to put a capstone on everything from episode 1 onwards. And nothing about this movie at all makes me more excited than that particular bit of information. I love the idea of connecting these nine movies together and making it feel much more cohesive because they're not the most cohesive bunch of movies. They're all great, but they kind of split into chunks of three and those chunks of three are very independent of one another. And I love the idea of making them a little bit more dependent on one another. And what better way to start doing that than by throwing in Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi in episode nine and, and Hayden Christensen as well as Anakin Skywalker. It doesn't have to be a force ghost, you can have flashbacks, but but there's there's something inherently wonderful in the thought of closing that loop and bringing it all together and making it feel like such a strong, cohesive story. And I hope and I pray that that's what J.J. Abrams is doing, and it sounds like it is, and Ewan McGregor being there is a step in the right direction, baby. I am all for this news, despite the amount of salt and Mrs. Dash I had to consume in order to let it go down smooth. I love the Ninja Turtles. That's no secret. The Ninja Turtles are amazing. I've loved all the cartoons. I love all the movies. And I'm going to be real with you. When it comes to the last two movies, the first one, not great. They didn't just drop the ball. They dropped several balls and then stepped on those balls. The second one, TMNT Out of the Shadows. Yes. All kinds of yes. I was so happy with what I got in that movie. I was over the moon. I was like Homer Simpson in the Land of Chocolate. That movie was exactly the Turtles movie I had been waiting for all my life. And since the day I saw it, I've been hoping and praying to get a third installment in this trilogy. More of Krang, more of Bebop and Rocksteady, more of Shredder. I just wanted more of that story. And even though Out of the Shadows made its money back, it didn't make enough to warrant a third film. And for the longest time, news on that third film has been just crickets. Nothing was happening. Now it looks like Paramount has finally decided to pull the plug. And there will not be a sequel to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. But the good news, question mark, is that they're rebooting it again. Apparently, Paramount is going to reboot the franchise again, and they are making another live-action Ninja Turtles franchise. Again, according to a report from THR, the screenwriter of Bad Words, a guy by the name of Andrew Dodge, has been hired to develop the script for this new movie. The producers from Platinum Dunes are all back on board to produce the film, but it's not clear if Michael Bay himself will be as involved as he was last time. That's literally all we know right now. We have no idea when this is going to you know, get the green light, when production will start, when it will come out. It's still way too early to say. I'm still bummed that we're not getting a sequel to Out of the Shadows, but maybe if they start fresh and eliminate the many huge mistakes they made in the first Michael Bay film, we might possibly have the perfect cocktail. Maybe. If any of you are Turtles fans out there, I implore you, jump in the comments and let me know how this news makes you feel. Ninja Turtles movies are such a give and take with Turtles fans. The cartoons, you're always going to be happy. The cartoons are great. But the movies, they they seem to sort of exist in their own world and they care not for the inklings of us mere mortals. And even if we say we want Shredder, they're going to just laugh and say, well, here's Walker and Lord Norinaga. That's just how they roll. So let me know, how, how does this news sit with you? Are you bummed about losing this franchise just when it was getting good? Are you excited with the possibility of starting fresh and maybe getting things right right off the bat this time, let me know. Either way, I'll be excited to see the Turtles back once again, eventually. I'll probably be 40 when this movie exists. Finally, if you're like me, this past weekend you made it out to see Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and if you're also like me, you found it to be one of the best Jurassic Park movies ever made, right up there with part one. Uh, And for the first time ever, 
like I said in my review, a Jurassic Park movie has major spoilers in it. That made me very happy. Obviously, it made a lot of people very happy. And Colin Trevorrow is the man who's sort of the mastermind behind this trilogy. He directed the first Jurassic World. He's coming back to direct the third one. And he executive produced this second one, Fallen Kingdom. And I believe he's been a very heavy presence in the writer's room as well. So this whole trilogy is basically Colin Trevorrow's baby. Now, if you have not seen Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, I will not spoil it for you here. However, I mentioned in my review that I was very stunned by how many spoilers are in the trailers. The trailers contain multiple spoilers for this film. I'm not going to put up images of what they spoil because that kind of defeats the purpose. But I was, you know, a little put off by that and it turns out Colin Trevorrow was too. Colin did a recent interview with io9 and talked about two particular scenes that showed up in the trailers that he wished had not been shown there. Trevorrow said, it was very frustrating for me. That's a relationship that we have with marketing and there are a lot of different needs. I try to be very lucid and rational about it, but to speak frankly, there is a very, very small percentage of people who watch all the trailers. The rest of the world might only see one. Now, Trevorrow did go on to try to see things from marketing's point of view, and he said he thinks the reason that they put these specific shots in there was because this is the fifth Jurassic Park movie now, and in a world where sequels are sneered at right off the get-go, it felt like the franchise kind of needed to continue to prove the merit of its own existence. So he said, in order to show how different this movie was going to be, the folks in marketing thought it would be wise to include these specific shots. And there's even a very particular line of dialogue in the trailer that is incredibly spoilerific. And having that in there was even more of a big shock. Trevorrow's trying to see both sides of the coin, and I, I think that's very big of him and very professional of him. But if I was him, if I was the story guy behind this trilogy, I'd be very upset that these things were brought to the forefront. So if you have still not seen Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, on behalf of these talented people who put the work behind it, I urge you, go and see it. And don't watch the trailers at all, if you haven't already. Go in there fresh, and you will come out of that film with a smile on your face, and you'll be like, you know what? Not only is Andrew drop-dead sexy, but he was right. And then watch the trailers, and look at all the spoilers. It's a lot more fun that way. You can be like, oh my god, they showed that? Hopefully Jurassic World 3 has a better marketing strategy than Fallen Kingdom did. That's all I'm going to say. And that's literally all I'm going to say, because that's the end of today's episode of Real Deal. Thank you so much for watching all the crazy entertainment news that's not fit to print. At least as far as I'm concerned, because I don't own a printing press. My name is Andrew Fantasia. Thank you for joining me. I will see you here next time. Until then, adios. Adios. <laughs>